challenge me to do this word today. It's going to be a difficult word, uh, but I feel it's really important to identify this and move forward, okay? Um, I was praying in the week, and the Lord was showing me, <laughs> do you know the story where, where Jesus is going to heal the dead girl, and he dismisses the people out of the room? Only certain ones are allowed to stay. Why is that? Unbelief. Unbelief, right? Unbelief stops faith from moving forward. All right? And we're going to talk about that theme today. But I felt the Lord has been speaking to all of us that, that something really big is about to happen in the Lord in this place. Do you believe that? But we're not going to get there until we shake this thing off. There's a spirit of unbelief. There's a spirit contrary to the, uh, the spirit of God that's wanting to work in this place. And so we have to confront it. We have to call it out and rebuke it for us to move forward in the Lord. Amen? So there's a thing. If you want to step into the things of God, if you want to step into faith and overcoming... You have to get this out of your life because it will disqualify you from the things of God. And we're going to give lots of ex examples of that. So let's just start in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God. We just bless your name, Lord. We just, we just meditate on that psalm of Asaph this morning. God, we enter into your presence, Lord, and that changes our perspective. Holy God, give us your perspective. Give, give us your mindset. God, we just speak to all fear and unbelief all control, all intimidation, any spirit that is opposed to the living God in this place, any spirit that's trying to cause chaos and damage to the body to stop it from moving into the things of God, we just rebuke you now in Jesus' name. We tell you to leave this place off of every ear, off of every heart, off of every family. Go in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just speak sincere faith. Just put your hands out. Lord Jesus, I receive sincere faith. Sincere faith, Lord God. Overcoming faith. Holy God, you've called us. You said you're, we're more than overcomers in Christ Jesus. Holy God, if we would only trust you, if we would only obey, Lord God, the promises of God will come in this place. In each family, in each heart. And Lord God, we just shake off anything that's trying to disqualify anyone here from entering into the rest of God. Holy God, every spirit open, ears open to hear. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Any deaf ears, any ears sealed by the Lord, we just say you're sealed in Jesus' name. Holy God, holy God, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We want to hear what you're speaking to the church, Lord. So there's many weapons of the enemy, and I just felt the Lord showing us we need to learn to identify the weapons of the enemy. And one of the weapons of the enemy is grumbling and murmuring. It's a spirit of unbelief. It's trying to get in your ear and affect your inner part. So while I was preparing this, I just saw th this picture. I watch a lot of World War documentary kind of things. And in this, one of the weapons that militaries use and have developed over time is, is this thing, it's noise war warfare. It's an ancient tactic. Uh, remember uh, the siege of Jerusalem? And the Assyrians came, and in their own language, they mocked them and scoffed at them and, and intimidated them. Or one of the tactics is blowing trumpets and shouting and the voices of multitudes, right? Or smashing jars or whatever. But now we have these ultrasonic weapons and all of that kind of stuff. There's, there's things that can actually uh, do damage just in the sound. And this is just a, like a textbook definition, all right? I just Google this. Noise warfare. Sonic weapons have been used for literally thousands of years to disrupt intimidate, confuse, and even injure opponents. Isn't that interesting? So I saw that weapon going out, and I said, oh, Lord, that's exactly what this spirit is. It's a spirit of intimidation, of disruption, of confusion, and injury. It's looking to injure the body. It's lo looking to injure the church from entering in to the callings of God. 
So we're going to identify this today so you can choose what side of this you want to be on. All right? We need to talk about gossip today. All right? So gossip's a funny word because we all say gossip. All right? Uh, but there's many words in the Bible for gossip. There's many things that it's translated as that are not necessarily the word that we understand. Sometimes it's a different word is used, but it's all the kind of same meaning, okay? So I'm going to look at the definitions of these things because I grew up in the church. My father was a pastor, and um, I believe the most tolerated sin in all of Christianity is gossip. It's uh, a weapon of the enemy, but somehow we dismiss it as something small or petty and not a big deal. But the scripture clearly says that people who participate in this behavior cannot and will not enter the kingdom of God. God is opposed to you if you practice gossip, murmuring, grumbling, complaining. Okay? So we need to look at this. But I think in English, we kind of say, what is gossip? We kind of dismiss it and make it a smaller thing. Um, I grew up as a kid, and I remember people talking about gossip. And um, I remember overhearing adults in the church gossiping. <laughs> and I'd say, well, isn't that gossip what you just did? Because they would always tell us not to gossip. But I'd hear them and I'd say, isn't that gossip? And they'd say, oh, no, no, gossip's only something if and what, right? We have these weird little definitions of what gossip is. And it always pertains to something someone else is doing and somehow not what we're doing. Okay, so I want to look at the biblical definitions of gossip and how it's actually a really big deal to God. But in English, it's been dumbed down to something kind of like petty schoolgirls do when actually it's a very sinister weapon of the enemy. So 1 Timothy 5, 13. Um, I've been reading a lot of Timothy lately. Uh, it says, at the same time, they also learn to be idle. And now, I don't have time to go into all these words, but there's a lot in here if you look at the language. Because again, we have this thing called Christianese. Has anyone heard that? Do you know you all speak Christianese? It's a language. It's a Christian language. We have all these words, but they've lost their meaning because we say them so many times. And so I, I, I implore you, go back, read these passages, but really think about what each of the words mean. Don't dismiss them. Don't just read through it. Look at it and say, God, is that in my life in any way? It says they learn to be idle. Uh, it's, it's kind of like useless. It's not just about being lazy. It's actually they, they could be doing stuff, but it's not producing anything. As they go around from house to house and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper, uh, the word here for not proper, I don't think that's expressed well in English. It means it's not necessary or needed or behooving or right, okay? Uh, so they're, they're doing lots of things, but it's not, it's not lifting people up. It's not edifying them. It's actually bringing down. So this word for gossip here in, in the Greek is flueros. It means babbling. And the image that it gives is a pot boiling over. Has anyone had a pot of potatoes on the, on the hob and it's boiling over? What do you do when your pot is boiling over? You jump back and then you put your full arsenal on all your things and you kind of go in and you have to you know, turn it down and try to get it calmed down, right? But what's your first instinct? Is to pull back, isn't it? Because that's dangerous, that's splashing, it's out of control, and it's going to burn you. Well, this word for gossip is literally describing that. <laughs> um, we were joking the other day, I, I, I was using this word, and Casey was also using this word. Uh, it's a hot mess, you know, so-and-so is a hot mess, you know, a hot bed of drama, you know. Uh, we all have people like that in our lives that are always in a state of drama. They're always in a state of chaos. No matter what you do, you ever have something on the hob that no matter how low you turn down the heat, that thing doesn't stop bubbling over. It's beyond repair. It's beyond. So, so this is a heart condition, guys, 
to, to, it's a seething boiling pot. And it talks about like the, the water bubbles. Water is nothing. It's hollow. There's, so it has a lot to say, but it's nothing. It's just empty. It's just a lot of nothing. Um, it also is referring to tattle, tattletales. Anybody ever be a child and you say, oh, so-and-so is a tattletale? Yeah. It's literally a grown-up version of a tattletale. It's like they always have to tell everyone else is doing something wrong and I have to tell you about it. And this has to be the most important thing in your life right now. Do you know this thing destroys the church? Destroys the church because it makes makes the atmosphere of the church toxic. It makes it that everyone has to step back. It makes every, everything that should be the center of attention not the center of attention. And all the conversation, all the attention, all the, all the, um, the support and help and everything is going to something hollow and empty and useless and destructive. Do you see how bad this is? So... There is this thing in the church, okay? Christians are supposed to bear one another's burdens. All right, this is from Galatians 6 too. And this is true. The problem with sound warfare is it's subtle and it's sneaky and it's hard to spot. Because do you know like an ultrasonic sound or like a dog whistle? You can't hear it but it's actually disrupting your inner part. It's like, because sound is a vibration, right? And it actually shakes you to your core. And you might not be conscious of it, but it's still operating. So this is, this is manipulation. That's the spirit of manipulation. It's working, and you can't quite put your finger on it because it sounds right but somehow it's twisted. Somehow it's actually damaging. So what I find is that spirit of murmuring and gossip and, and confusion and chaos, right? It, it usually is saying something that sounds right, but it's wrong. And it's always trying to accuse someone else of something where they're wrong. It's like, you know a magician? A magician has the white glove and the, and the wand, and it's like, look over here, but where's the magic happening? It's happening behind his back. It's behind his back. And why does he wave the wand? Because he doesn't want you to look behind his back. Because then you'll actually figure out what it is. So that, that drama is a smokescreen for immorality. If you constantly have chaos and drama in your life, there's something in you that's wrong. But you're trying to put it on everyone else. You're trying to say, look over here, look over there, when really it's here, okay? So one of these things, I was hearing this voice, it says Christians are supposed to bear one another burden. Well, now that's true, but what does that look like? You can't just take one scripture and make it all about your situation. You have to look at context, okay? That is used for manipulation, okay? You put it in context. There's lots of other verses that talk about these things. And I just felt the Lord saying, the answer, if you're hearing that voice around you in the Christian community or in this church or anywhere, if you're hearing this thing, oh, I have to help so-and-so, I have to listen to so-and-so, I have to abed that, even though I feel sick around it, even though it's bothering me and robbing me of my peace and my joy, I have to be a good Christian and, and help. We all feel this. What's the scripture say? Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So yes, are there times we're to help one another? Yes. Are there times we bear a shoulder with one another and bear each other's burdens? Yes. But there are dramas and situations of people's lives that they need to cast on the Lord. You can't cast it on people. You have to cast it on the Lord. Christians aren't required to listen to people's problems. All of you are smiling, but you're not really sure if that's true. I'm a pastor. I'll tell you this. Christians are not required to listen to people's problems. And pastors don't have to give you continual advice. See, again, it's true, but it's, it's untrue, right? Right? 
So are, are Christians supposed to bear each other's burdens? Are we, supposed to, are we supposed to be able to come to each other and confide things and, and lay things on each other and go to the Lord together? Yes. But see, this has become abusive. Do you know that Christians abuse pastors? Do you know I grew up in the church. I have seen so many qualified godly men and women leave the ministry Literally just pack up everything and move to some hole somewhere to get away from people. People that, that loved people and wanted to serve them and wash their feet. And they were abused by the church. Pastors are abused. By, listen, I'm tired of Christians saying that churches are abusive. Can I tell you, Christians are abusive. You're not in an abusive church. You're among abusive Christians who need to get sanctified and made holy and repent. And do you know what? I know. I know this is a big thing in Ireland because I was told, I was told, you're American, you won't last long here. We give you a year at most and you'll be gone because all the Canadian and American pastors come here and then they pack it up and they leave. Do you know why? I don't know the inner workings of most of the places, so I can't say. But I know some of them, and I know a good majority of them, were eaten alive by their congregations. By the worries and cares of life that people want to come and put on them and make their problem instead of going to the Lord. And that's sin. Do you know leaders will have to give an account for what, what uh, they speak and if they lead people astray? But I want to say in reverse, I believe many people will have to give an account for the leaders that they have abused because that is a spirit of Jezebel. It's a spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel killed the prophets of God. That's very serious. So we need to put this in proper perspective because, do you know, uh, the Proverbs talk about, you know, living with a contentious wife and, and that sound of continual dripping. Do you know, I remember my grandfather, he was German and he, he helped in the war for the Americans in, in Germany. And um, he, he would teach us all the different ways that people would torture people. I know that sounds really, Germans are kind of dark, so just forgive us. But so anyway, he taught us all about Chinese water torture. And I never believed him as a kid. I said, that can't really work. And he said, no, if you slowly drip on somebody's forehead over and over and over again, they will go mentally insane. And do you know, that's what gossip does. That's what manipulation, that's what undermining, that's what whining and complaining and giving out does. It wears people slowly insane. That's why the divorce rate's so high. That's why churches break up. So Christians aren't required to listen to people's problems. Pastors don't have to give you continual advice. If you come to your pastor and ask for, listen, I, I just want to make this statement. There are a lot of you who are going through things who should come to Kyle and I. I just want to say that. You're not coming to us, but you should. Because that is our role. We will give you godly counsel and help where it's needed. But I've learned, I've learned something in the church. The people who need the most help never come forward for help. And the people who need the last ha least help are the ones who ring and call the pastor and talk to them incessantly to the point where all the people who really do need help never get to talk to the pastor and they say, oh, the pastor's too busy for me. You're all laughing because you've all seen it. Do you know? So listen, Christians and pastors, if, if your pastor has given you advice on a topic and you haven't done it, and then you want to come back and complain that your life is a mess and keep talking about that issue, you're in rebellion against God. You don't have a problem with your pastor. You have a problem with God. And your pastor does not have to talk to you about that issue anymore because you're in rebellion. You just don't like the answer. So if you haven't tried on the advice, if you haven't done it, at least for a year, continually, I'm sorry, it takes at least a year to bear some fruit in your life. It's, it's a dripping, Okay? So, no, your pastor does not have to meet with you and talk to you about that. Christians and pastors are both supposed to direct you to God, to go to God. That's what they're supposed to do. So, listen, bear one another's burdens in the context of directing people to the Lord. Okay? So, if someone's a hot mess, right, you say, oh, look, hon, look, go to the, go to the Lord. 
He's going to help you. with. Cast all your anxieties on him. Let's go pray together. Go, in, go over in that corner. Go pray to the Lord. Seek what he has to say. Do you know? But you have to be willing to receive that advice or else it's not going to work. So examples of that. I have way too many scriptures. You're going to have to pray for me. <laughs> Someone in the crowd said, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he says, uh, man, who appointed me as judge and arbiter over you? Jesus was not getting involved in that, right? He will come and be the judge and arbiter over them. But he, anyway, it's a whole long conversation. But the point is, he didn't get involved in that because what was going on? A hot mess. They were greedy. They wanted the thing that they weren't given. They weren't thankful. And they wanted Jesus to come and give. Tell me what the Bible says about this situation, about how so-and-so is wrong. Your pastor doesn't have to tell you that because Jesus didn't have to. Martha's the same way. She says, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. And Jesus turns to her and says, Martha, you're the one worried and bothered. And then I like this one in 2 Timothy 2, 4. It says, no soldier in active service entangles himself, uh, another translation says, in civilian affairs so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. So guys, the only one that you have to, as a Christian, take orders from is Jesus. Amen. Don't let another Christian tell you, well, if you, you have to love your neighbor, and if you love your neighbor, you'll do this and that. And you should bear my burden because the Bible says, no, 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 I, I have to listen to him. I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> now, be respectful about it. Be kind and loving about it. But know where your orders come from. And if he hasn't told you to get involved in that situation, you don't have to. So another word for gossip is, uh, is this one, periergos. Uh, I'm not going to say all the Greek words. You can look them up yourself. Uh, overly careful, cautious, meddling, a busybody. All right? So I want to look at this passage, 1 Timothy 5.13. We already read it, okay? We, we looked at the word gossip in it, but it also has the word busybody. All right, and we see this word busybody uh, in another. Now, listen, this whole teaching came from this. The Lord showed me this months ago, and he said, Rachel, just hold on to that. You're going to need that little nugget of information later. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> I took a screenshot of it on my phone, and I saved it. And the Lord told me this week, he said, now's the time I want you to bring that word, okay? So what I found... I don't know how I stumbled on it, but I was, I was doing some research on some, for something else. And I saw this word in a word search. Acts 19, it says, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Okay, so this is a big thing in Acts where people are repenting and coming out of idolatry and witchcraft and all this kind of stuff and coming to serve the Lord and they're burning their things. But do you know what I found? This word for the books, practiced magic, that word there, is the same word as busybodies. And it's the only time that that word is used. It's the same exact word. Do you know that if you're a busybody, you're practicing witchcraft? So let's read it. It says, the definition of this word is overly careful, curious, meddling, a busybody, overwrought, superfluous, curious, uncanny, uh, curious arts, magic, meddlesome, belonging to magic. It means parry all around, Aragon work. So it's all around work. It means you're overdoing. You're spending an excessive amount of time where it doesn't belong or it should not happen. This is what we call control. Control. You ever see a child hold its breath so long till it passes out because it wants a sweet? That's control. This is manipulation. This is meddling. So when you're always involved in everyone else's affair and you're trying to turn the outcome in your direction and you spend excessive amounts of time talking and doing things that are useless, you're, you're practicing the spirit. Because where does all power and authority come from? It comes from God. 
See, so if you had gone and prayed about that issue, you could have seen, well, God, what are you doing in this situation? What's your will? What's your outcome? But the problem is you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear what God has to say. You don't want to ask your pastor. Your pastors, if people tell you, go and ask your pastor, and you don't do it, there's a reason why. It means you're in rebellion. It means you don't want to know what they have to say because you already know what they're going to say, and you don't want to hear it. And do you know what? I was reading about it. Moses, in the rebellion, he's given his bud, uh, sorry, his, um, his staff buds, as a sign of authority against rebellion. And the Lord reminds them, you haven't rebelled against Moses, you've rebelled against God. And so this stuff is very serious and I have to bring it up. This is not a personal thing for me. This is, I care about your soul because if you're in a rebellion against God, you will not enter his kingdom. So what happens when we don't want the answer? We want to get the outcome that we want. We want to get the answer that we want. So what do we do? We put our hands on it. We get involved in it. We talk to all the people around the situation to try to win them, to turn them, to move them, to do what we want. That's a spirit of witchcraft. What's what's witchcraft? Spells and divinations and potions and incantations and all of that to get the outcome that you want. It's power and influence without submitting to God. It's saying, if I submit to God, his power, his authority can work in this situation. But it's saying, I don't want to submit. I want power and authority. I want results through my ability. Anytime you're doing that, that's a spirit of witchcraft. And God is opposed to that. So I found that interesting. I think that's a really interesting thing. Another word for gossip, it's translated gossip sometimes, but it can be translated other things as well, is... um, Sithuristus, okay? It means a whisperer, a secret slanderer. And I want, I want you to pay attention to this word secret, okay? Whispering to quietly spread malicious gossip. Whispering that launches a secret attack on a person's character. All right, do you know the word secret? Anybody understand? Okay. I won't. Uh, The word secret has to do with the occult. If you see the word secret on something, buy this and find out the secret of such and such. Get the secret uh, answer to success or power or money or whatever. You've just found something that has occult practice in it. Because Jesus says he disclosed things plainly. Okay? Anything that is hidden, anything that is secret, is not of God. That's of darkness. It's not of light. So, um, there was literally a book called The Secret. And it was about using the power of, um, what's it called? Basically, there's there's power of attraction. Thank you. If I believe it, if I speak it, I will receive it. Now, is that a spiritual principle? Yes, it is, right? Jesus says whatever a man believes, that he has, right? Um, What you sow is what you reap. So those are all spiritual principles, but they only work in submission to God, in, in, in submission to God's law and his word. If you're trying to do that principle outside of him, if you're trying to do it in rebellion and your own will and agenda, you're operating in witchcraft. So I found it interesting. The title of the book was literally The Secret. So this is, another definition is a sneaky gossip, a backstabber, a backbiter, quietly, secretly destroying another person's character, covertly, not in the open, but rather operating in a corner. I find this very interesting because as pastors, we are trained. If we see people, two people in a corner, not being a part of the church congregation, but you're whispering in a corner to somebody else, we know your intentions are not good towards the body. And I've trained all my ministry team to notice that. So it's good for you to know that. But it's literally in this definition. It's a spirit that wants to pull people alo- alone. And, and, and I just want to say it. If someone has told you not to tell someone something, especially a person of authority... 
that that's probably an ungodly situation and you need to bring it to the authorities. Because I taught my children at a young age, if an adult comes and tells you something or does something to you and says to you, don't tell your mom and dad. I've taught my child that's how you identify a predator. That's a predator. That person is trying to harm you. And, and the very first thing they will tell you is don't tell an authority figure. So if you are hearing that voice or if you're speaking that to other people, you were a predator in this church. We don't trust you because your motives are not God's motives. Your interests are not God's interests. Your interests are yourself and you're looking to damage and hurt someone. Now it might not be intentional, but there's a spirit working there in your life that you need to repent of. And if authorities have come and challenged you to, that you need to repent of that and you have not, now you're in rebellion against authority and against God. And that's why you're telling, keep it a secret. So I just want to encourage all of you, if Christians are holding to you to keep silent about something, that person is not necessarily working in godly, godly counsel, okay? Something's not right. Their eye's not clean on something. And I just want to absolve you of that. You're, you're cleared of that. Don't, don't feel the condemnation and control of that. Don't suffer in silence under that anymore. Confess that to somebody you trust, somebody in the Lord, somebody who's going to give you right counsel and see your eye clearly and help you remove that thing because manipulation, witchcraft, control, that kind of thing, it's so subtle. Again, like the noise warfare, it confuses you, it disorients you, and you're not really sure what's, what's up from down. So in that place, you need to go to somebody. Go to a pastor, an authority figure in that place who's going to clearly like Solomon. Remember the two women fighting over the baby? And it was just a hot mess of confusion, right? And he came and he brought the sword to sort it out. And you need those kind of authority figures in your life. You don't need somebody who's like, oh, it's okay, I understand, I'll hold your hand through that. No, that's how you got in the mess in the first place. You have too many of those voices around you. So the, the voice, uh, the, these verses, Romans 1.29, being filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, envy, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips. That's this, this thing. Um, one of the words it's also used for in literature is for the magical murmuring of a snake charmer. Isn't that interesting? You ever hear the whole thing, they're a horse whisperer, they're a dog whisperer, they're, you know, people, that means somebody has a gift in that. Somehow, they're able to convince that wild beast to submit to them. That's scary. If you're doing that to other believers, that's scary. That's not, that's not the spirit of God. The only one you should be leading them in submission to is Yahweh. If they're leading, if you're binding them in secret and, and to loyalty to you, <sighs> there's going to be a big fall coming for you if you don't repent of that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 20, for I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find uh, you not to, to be not what I wish and may find, may be found by you to be not what you wish. But perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry, temper tantrums, disputes, rivalry, ambition. Uh, that word for disputes is rivalry or ambition. Slanders, gossip, this is that word, that murmuring, that secret enticing. Arrogance is puffing up. Disturbances is instability, disorder, commotion, confusion. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's good to kind of, because we lose meaning of what these words are. So if you're seeing these kinds of things in your life or in other people's lives, these things are opposed to God. So again, the point is repentance. We don't want to just cut people off as bad guys, but we need to identify this is not godly behavior and it needs to be brought under submission to the blood of Christ. So you see these things working in these kinds of scenarios. Let's look at underhanded manipulation. One situation. Going to someone close to a leader to get what you want, all right? So instead of going to the leader and asking, you go to someone you perceive as being close to them, a right-hand person or someone that they trust and trying to get what you want. So the Lord showed me this, this from... Um, a uh, story in 1 Kings 2, 
after David dies and Solomon becomes king, there were other people who thought that they should become king. And they're trying to do a power play, okay? So uh, we know that from the story of Absalom. Caitlin did a great teaching on that not long ago. But there was another son who thought that he should be king. And so what he wants is he's trying to do a power play and get one of David's uh, wives, okay? And he's thinking, if I, if I marry this woman now that he's dead, then people will look at me at, at, in a place of authority. So he goes to Bathsheba, who is the mother of now King Solomon. And he says to her, now I am making one request of you. Do not refuse me. And she said to him, speak. Then he said, please speak to Solomon, the king, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishag the Shunammite as a wife. And Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to the king for you. So what this is, is there's a spirit there working. We, we talked about the Absalom spirit. If you, if you haven't seen that teaching and you're interested in this, go back and watch that. It's on, it's on our media page, okay? Absalom tried to take authority away from King David, his father. He tried to win people to him. And do you know what the enemy wants to do to people that leaders rely upon? Do you know that leaders rely on people? Moses had to lift his arms for the battle. And what, his arms got tired. So Aaron and her come and lift up one arm so that they won't lose the battle. Do you know that leaders rely on people to hold them up? But do you know what the enemy wants to do? Well, if I, I might not be able to kick out the legs from underneath that leader, but if I kick out their supports, or better, if I turn their supports against them, See, so I found there's a spirit working that wants to turn right-hand helpers into Absaloms. And so if, if you're, you're seeing that going around you, if you're, if you're seeing that happen in your life, if you have a tendency to, I don't like what Kyle and Rachel said. I don't like the advice that they are giving me, so I'm not going to ring them anymore. I'm going to ring one of their assistants. And when they don't answer my calls, or when they're not giving me the answer that I want anymore, I'm going to go to another right-hand person. If you're seeing that tendency in your life, that's manipulation. You need to repent of that, because great will be your fall. Uh, another underhanded manipulation tactic of this, this secret seducing spirit is uh, believing, believing you could have done a better job in leading or shepherding someone. So maybe there's a situation that goes on and it didn't end well. And you think, oh, well, if the pastors had done it this way, it wouldn't have happened like that. If I could have only talked to that person, they wouldn't have walked away from the Lord. We've all thought it before. I know, because before I was a leader, I was in a place of assistance, and I found that this voice constantly came to me as a right-hand person to, to leadership. So that's pride. That's huge pride and arrogance. If you think you can do better. And what happened to um, Miriam and Aaron, right? Aaron still had to work in the temple, but so he, the Lord didn't smite him the way that he did Miriam, but Miriam had to be unclean and outside the camp. He said, if the father spat in your face, you'd go outside the camp for at least seven days, so we got to put her out. Why? Because they murmured and complained against Moses. He was God's man. Does that mean leaders do everything perfectly? No. But you're not in that position, so why do you think you could do better? See, this leads rebellion. This leads rebellion against the things of God. Uh, so an example of that, 2 Samuel 15, 2 through 4, Absalom used to rise early and stand by the gate, and when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me as judge in the land. Then every man who has a, a case or a suit could come to me, and I would give him justice. 
So if you think you could do a better job or you're implying to people that you could do a better job or that you should be appointed to that situation, there's an Absalom spirit working in you and you need to repent. Because Absalom got hung in a tree by his hair by the Lord. Yeah? He didn't get the, that seat of, of power that he thought he was going to get. John 17, 12. While I was with them, I was keeping them. This is Jesus. He's praying to the Father. I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And as I was praying about this, I heard the Lord say, they think they can do a better job than me. Do you know Jesus couldn't win Judas? Do you think you could do a better job of winning a Judas who intended to betray Jesus? We're going to actually look at a, a verse including Judas as an example. Really? Like he lost people. There were people that the love of Jesus could not win. So if you're so prideful to think that you could love people and counsel them better than Jesus, see, we don't think of it as that because that sounds foolish. But actually examine that situation, examine that in your life and say, whoa, whoa, that's the pride of Satan right there. I will ascend above the most high God. So let's look at that example. Do you know what I found really interesting? As I got into this, guess what? You know, the bubbling pot thing or the secret murmuring thing or all, all of those things are examples in scripture. But do you know one of the most commonly used Greek words for gossip? Diablos. Do you know what that word means? My Spanish speaking friends in the back understand that. It means the devil. Do you know the devil's name is the accuser, the slanderer? This word means a false accuser, unjustly criticizing to hurt, malign, and to condemn, to sever a relationship. Isn't that interesting? People will have a relationship. Oh, what's the one Psalm or Proverb is talking about those who separate close friends. That's what he does. You'll have people who are walking in close standing with godly believers, with leaders and authorities and churches, and they're growing in the Lord. I have seen this countless times. You're like so excited. You're like, wow, I cannot believe the, the growth in their life and how God has healed them. And, they're, and they're, they're moving up in the Lord and they're coming into maturity. And then one day, they just totally lose it. And you find out somebody came in and maligned, brought a voice of accusation. Can you really trust the church? Can you really trust God? Can you really trust Kyle and Rachel? And then all of a sudden that person has no fruit in their life because all the fruit gets stolen. Because what happened to Adam and Eve when they heard that voice? They came out of relationship with God. And that voice, if you're hearing it, it's trying to separate you from this church. But worse, it's trying to separate you from God. That's very serious. Don't let any person, we talked about soul ties not long ago. Another good teaching you should follow up on and watch uh, in relation to this. But do you know what? I don't care how close they are. Deuteronomy says, if you have a friend or a family member who's as your own soul, who tries to entice you away from the living God, let that person be dead to you. Because we've all felt it. We've all heard that voice trying to entice us, trying to pull us away from this place, from fellowship with God. Oh, don't be too religious. You've gone too heavy. You're, 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 all you're doing is worshiping and spending time in that church and reading that Bible of yours. Come on. You're so earthly. You're so, sorry, you're so heavenly minded. You're no earthly good. We've all heard this. So we need to, we need to come away from that thing. That is the voice of the enemy. He's the backbiter, the accuser, the slanderer. Um, it's saying literally someone who casts through, cuts through, making charges that will bring down and destroy. Remember, remember Jezebel? She sets up false witnesses to come and accuse Naboth, to have him cut down. And it used, she used religious language. She used scripture to do it. Do you know Satan, when he came to test Jesus, he used scripture? 
So just because it's religious, just because it says it's a Christian and acts like a Christian doesn't mean it's a Christian. uh, There's sheep in wolf's clothing. Well, there's devils in Christian's clothing. There are gossips, they're slanderers, they're backbiters, they're revilers. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 11. Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must be first tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are found beyond reproach. Women, and the whole point is women can be deacons as well. Women, likewise, are dignified, to be dignified and not malicious gossips. This is that word, malicious gossips. It's actually the word devil. They're not to be devils, but temperate, faithful in all things. John 6, 70 through 71, Jesus answered them, did I find myself, did I myself not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? This is that same word. Malicious gossips, devil, synonymous, okay? Uh, The point was Judas was undermining him. He was undermining his authority. He was looking to sever relationships. He was looking for his own sort of gain. What was Satan's thing? I'll ascend above the most high. I'm going to use this, and I'm going to sever people, and they'll worship me instead. See, that's very serious. And that's what, that's what Judas was doing. And then eventually later, Satan actually entered him to fulfill prophecy. So uh, I found this very interesting years ago. I went through uh, a very painful situation where uh, I was betrayed by a close friend. And in bringing that to the Lord, the Lord woke me up early one morning. And he gave me this verse. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. Because when I read it in English, it wasn't very clear. And so I looked at it in the Greek and then at a couple different situations. And then I said, oh, Lord, now I understand what you're trying to tell me. It says, now he meant Judas. Now he's speaking to Judas, right? But he's saying, now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Issachar. For he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. Okay, so a lot of times in English, it talks about Judas. It says, Judas the one who betrayed Jesus, right? That's how it's translated in English. So when we read that, we think of like in Ireland where lots of people are named Mary and you're like, oh, was it Mary? They're like, no, not that Mary, the other Mary. You know, the Mary that lives by the pub, okay? So when we read that, Judas was a very common name. It means Judah, okay? Jesus has that name. (laughs) He's of that name. And you know what? We read it and we think it's saying Judas. No, not that Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus, that Judas. No, that's not what it's saying. In the language, it actually says Judas, who all along in his heart was intending, was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Doesn't that change? Doesn't that change it? And so the Lord was speaking that to me. Rachel, there are people like that. And even Jesus had that in his company. So, so, you know, we feel like we have to win people. We feel like, oh, maybe I failed in winning them. But do you know what? Jesus never failed in anything. And he couldn't win Judas. Why? Because all along in his heart, that Bitter root judgment was there. Moses said, be careful that none of you, in none of your hearts, it springs up a bitter root judgment against God. If you have a bitter root judgment against God, you're going to have bitter root judgment against any of his helpers. Because Jesus said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name. They're actually hating God. They're they're, they're against Jesus, so they're going to be against you. So we have to realize this thing can be in people's heart. And maybe it's in your heart. We can't think we're above that. So we need to examine those things. And what what did the Lord say to Cain? He says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door, and it seeks to devour you. But if you do what is right, will not things go well for you? See, so there's still an opportunity to turn. There's still an opportunity to repent for you. There's still an opportunity for that. So if, if, if you're feeling that thing coursing in you, turn to the Lord and do what's right. But what happened to Cain? 
he chose not to follow that advice, didn't he? And again, refer that back. Pastors don't have to give you advice because the Lord gave advice and lots of people didn't follow it. So don't come when you say, oh, I have blood in my hands because I murdered my brother. When you didn't listen to, hey, there's anger and malice and bitterness in your heart. Jesus says, if you have anger towards someone in your heart, you have a heart of murder. You have committed murder in your heart against them. If you lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your mind, in your heart with that person. That's very serious. How, does, how do you, don't think that you're ever beyond striking someone and killing them. It could happen to any of you. We've all had, Kyla talked about that this morning. Maybe the Lord is really speaking to that heart of anger in people's lives. That rage that springs up so quickly where you gnash your teeth. And I'm telling you, any object in your hand can become a weapon in that point. And if you have nothing, just your hand will do. So we can't think we're above that. We have to examine our hearts for these things. So the church and assembling together, that's what church means. It means assembly. Do you know, it's not about you. It's not about you. And if there's something in you that constantly feels a need of attention from Kyle or I or other authorities in this place, or, or you feel like, I have to get up and speak. I want to be heard. I, you have to let me finish what I'm saying. You have selfish ambition in your heart, okay? Now listen, we've all gone through that. We all have insecurities. We all have things. But it will turn into something very dangerous if you do not check it while it's small. So um, selfish ambition, it rivals God. It rivals others for worship and attention. It wants that place of worship and attention. It's desperately attention-seeking. It always has to be the center of attention. So if you identify somebody like that, or maybe you're like that, you need to pay attention to that because that is going to lead you a very bad path. Because whether you intend to or not, you, you know, you, you ever been in a situation where somebody takes all the air out of the room? <laughs> you know? You can never get a word in edgewise. You can never, because they're dominating the whole thing. That, that's selfish ambition, okay? And it might not be on purpose, but it is stealing attention, time, worship away from God or away from that social gathering. You ever like try to get together with a group of friends and one person just comes and dominates the whole thing and you didn't get to talk to the people that you went out there to talk to? Happens all the time. And that should not be happening in the church. There are lots of people that need attention and ministry and care, and they're not going to get it if, if you're always seeking that for yourself. Because do you know what that is? That's control. You don't trust God to give you that attention. You don't trust God to give you the care and the healing and the things that you need. So if someone tells you to go and pray about something or to just be quiet about something and to go rest in the Lord and, and seek him, they're not looking to hurt you or steal attention away from you. They're actually looking to connect you with the Father who gives you all that affection and affirmation and love. Listen, I, one of the best teachings I ever heard in worship years ago was from a friend of ours, Ivan Allen. And he talked about worship corporately is all about giving attention and praise to the Most High God. Worship time here, our gathering together here is not for you. And if you're coming here to receive something or get something from God or other people, you're in a place of sin. That, do you know what that means? It means you have a poor quality time relationship with God outside of this place. See, because Ivan would always say, I can identify somebody who does not have a worship and prayer life at home because they're always coming into this place looking to absorb and suck from everyone else and suck from God's attention and worship. But see, when you're home in your prayer time with the Lord, you can be as greedy as you want. I am my beloved's and he is mine and just absorb all that in. Stay rooted and grafted in and all of that and receive all of that nourishment and just let Jesus love on you and look at each other and love on each other and that's wonderful. If you do that all week long, when you come in here, you're going you're gonna to give out of the overflow of your life because you've received from the Lord. You've received from him in private and therefore you're going to have psalms and hymns and spiritual songs flowing out of you all the time. But if you don't, and you're always 
down and you're always criticizing and you're always dwelling on your problems and you're always giving out and you're always looking for somebody else to build you up and lift you up and do that kind of thing, you're trying to leech off of their relationship with God. And it can't be that way. It can't be that way. There's not enough for you. Remember the virgins? Remember the virgins? There was one company that had loads extra. They learned to live out of the overflow. And then there was a company that were shut out of the, of the, of the, bridal, the bridal week. Why? Because they didn't have enough. And when they realized they didn't have enough, they went to the ones who had more than enough, and they said, give it to me. What you've invested in, give it to me. Remember the harlot that, that had the child, and she lost her child, and she didn't care what it took. She was going to steal that other woman's baby. We, do, we can do that so easily. So let's, let's avoid these things. That's that selfish ambition. Uh, this is the word in the Greek. It means rivalry or ambition. It's the seeking of followers or adherents by the means of gifts. See, that's why beware of a flatterer. If someone's always telling you you look nice and you do this so nice and all, just look, receive a compliment once in a while. But if somebody's excessive in it, they want something. They want you to follow them. So whether they give you lots of gifts or they praise you all the time or something, that person has selfish ambition in their heart. And it's not, it's not, they're not going to lead you to the Lord. All right? Um, they're always rivaling and feuding, causing, causing strife and conflict with one another. They act for their own gain, regardless of the discord or strife it causes. It places its own interests ahead of what the Lord declares is right and what is good for others. That is not what this place is for. If you feel that rising up in your life, I'm warning you, because we love you. But that, that practice will no longer be tolerated here. It hasn't been, but maybe we've been gracious and we've tried to warn you a few times, but that has to stop. That stops now. And if, look, there's lots of other places. There's, I'm, I'm sure there's loads of churches in Ireland that are seeker sensitive that would love to give you attention. People build whole churches around that kind of thing but that's not gonna happen here. We serve the Lord only. He gets our worship, he gets our attention. All right, so Philippians 2, three through four, go home and read that. <laughs> all right, James three, it talks all about that and all about that demonic thing. That's a demonic thing in your heart that, that's rising up. And Galatians uh, five talks all about those disputes and factions and drunkenness and crowd, all these kinds of things that rise up in your heart and you won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's, it's saying that, that behavior, if you're selfishly ambitious and you're constantly rivaling other people, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What did Jesus say? Woe to you Pharisees, right? Who are always what? They want the seat of honor. They want the place of attention that everyone looks at them and says, look how spiritual you are. Look how wonderful you are. He says, if you receive praise from men in this earth, on this time, in this season, that's all you're going to get. You're not going to get it in the in eternal one. But if you see God's interests and you wash the, the, the feet of the, the saints and you serve in his house, he's going to give you a place of honor with him in his kingdom when he comes. Oh, dear. I have so many scriptures. <laughs> John 5, 3. I want to just look at this, th this contrast. This is the other bit the Lord really showed me. John 5, 3. We see this, this story um, in Solomon's, not in Solomon, sorry. In one of the porticos of the temple, there was this, po the, this pool of water. And all the sick would lay um, on mats or whatever in, in this place. Uh, because the water would get stirred up. And I caught something. I've read this story a million times. It, it caught me. I never realized this. It said, whoever was the first to step in. First in the pool, you know, if you've gone swimming in the sea, you always have that one brave one who jumps right in to get through the cold, and then you have the other one who kind of goes in slowly, right? So it's saying that first one, that first one in was the one that got healed. I always read it as anyone who got in the pool got healed. I don't know why I got it that way, but it says, no, the first one, the first one who pressed through and got in, they were healed. 
But what? We know the story. There's a man there. And he had been there laying next to this pool for 38 years. In we- in, he was in this condition. And it says ill. It can be translated lots of different ways. But the word is literally weakness. He was in, in this state of weakness. We don't know what his infirmity was. But you ever see this? this is, we have loads of disorders and names and medications for that now, where people are just in this helpless, weak state. Like, I need you to help me. Okay? Um, he's in this place of, place of weakness for 38 years. And Jesus saw him laying there. And Jesus knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. I think that's very important. Jesus recognized that. Why has he been in this condition so long? Do you know if somebody's in a condition for a long time, they might want to be in that condition? So Jesus is approaching this miracle already recognizing that. This guy's been sick for a long time. He's been sitting by this pool for a long time, and whoever goes in the pool gets healed. Something's not adding up. Do you know you can be in a church for years and never get well? I know the Western church is full of that. Sick, weak Christians. They don't know their Bible, they don't have a prayer life, and they're always in a woe is me situation. So Jesus approaches him, and before he does anything, do you know what he says to him? Do you wish to get well? Now people around him might have said, Jesus, Maybe you should have slept in this morning and had some coffee. Because if you had noticed, this man has been in this situation for 38 years. Everyone knows him. He lives by this pool. He, he's in this place, like he can't get up and do things for himself and all of that. And that's why he's sitting next to this pool and all of that. Jesus, maybe he didn't cop on that he wants to be made well. But Jesus is not stupid. Jesus knows. He sees to the heart. Jesus saw the condition of his heart. This man enjoyed being sick. This man enjoyed having other people care for him. This man enjoyed people looking on him with pity and feeling guilty for him. And that's where he, he lived. He lived out of that place. So Jesus says, do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him. He doesn't answer him yes or no. Jesus asks him, listen, there are open questions and there are closed questions. Jesus asked him a closed question. The only answer is yes or no. But see, a victim, this is what this is. This is called a victim spirit. A victim never has a yes or no answer because that would be too easy. They always answer a closed question with telling you their sob story. He says, sir, he doesn't call him Lord. He says, sir, I have no one to help me. I have no one to put me in the pool. If only, if only someone would just come and help me. He says, while I'm coming, I thought this was so interesting. It says, another person steps before me. So in this place of trying to get there, he always, he has this thing in his heart that other people are always getting ahead of him. Well, they got the attention. They got the healing. They got this, and I didn't. Because they must have something I don't have. They must have family. They must have friends. They must have, the pastor must get together with them and help them and counsel them on their own. But I have no one to help me. Victim. Do you remember Jacob and Esau, Cain and Abel? What was the difference? One was an overcomer, and one said, Oh, what is what is um, Esau say? Oh Lord, uh, Father, bless me because he came in and he stole it from me. No, he didn't. You just let him have it. Oh, he stole it from me, and then he's jealous and angry and, and bitter and, and murderous towards him the rest of his life. Jesus said to him, "Get up your pallet and walk." We know the story. He heals him, but what happens afterwards? A whole conversation happens. He gets distracted and uh, he pulls what we call the Irish goodbye. <laughs> he just slips out. He doesn't thank Jesus, doesn't anything. He just slips out. And Jesus purposely goes and tracks him down later. And he says, hey, hey boy, come here. Behold, you've become well. 
do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Do you know that Jesus was merciful to him? That man did not have to be healed by Jesus, but Jesus healed him to test his heart. Are you going to stay well? Are you going to stay well? Are you going to continue to walk in healing? But he saw in his heart, why did Jesus say that? That was something worse happened to you. Why did, Jesus, why did Moses say that in the promised land? He said, uh, you know, when you do all this, it'll do well. But when your king amasses chariots, when you do this, when you do that, when you, then the curses will come upon you. Why? Because Jesus saw in his heart he was already going to go back into it. Because that's how he got in the situation in the first place. But what's the difference? What's the difference today? There was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and she suffered much at the hands of many physicians. That's a whole rabbit hole that I don't have time to go for because I'm already over time. But I find she actually got worse by going to all the doctors. And in this place of desperation, there's a huge crowd coming out, and she just thinks to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I could be made clean. And it's against her, the culture for a woman to touch a man, let alone a man of God like that. But she doesn't care. She is so desperate for the Lord that she presses through the crowds, risks being trampled, and grabs a hold of Jesus, and power comes out from him, and she's instantly healed. Do you see this, the, the similarity in the situations? Big crowd, one place for healing, the first one who gets through gets the prize. You have one who says, I have no one to help me. I, I have to stay in this place because God is cruel to me. Lord, you're a cruel master, so I buried it in the ground. Or you have the overcomer who says, I don't care what it costs. I don't care if I have to crawl through the muck and the dirt and the poo to get to Jesus. I'm going to get there. That's the overcomer. And constantly Jesus says in all his miracles, he says, your faith has made you well. And I want to speak that over this place. Your faith will make you well. Your faith, will, listen, we all have trials, we all have tribulations, we all have momentary light afflictions, but if you choose to overcome, you will receive the overcomer's reward. But don't let any victim disqualify you from the kingdom, because a victim's always looking for a helper. If only I had someone to help me. And that's the warning in this place. Do not entertain grumbling and complaining because it will disqualify you from the promises of God. What happened to the spies? There were spies that went into the land and they were caused to see the good and glorious land that God wanted to give them. But what happened? Two had a heart of overcomers. If the Lord is with us, there's nothing we cannot obtain. God will give us this, this good land. But the majority said... We're not able to go up. It's too strong for me. And what they do in that place, in that place of victim, God's brought us out here to die. What they say, they, st so they spread a bad, malicious report. Do you know the word in the Hebrew there is whispering? It's the same word, same word. It's that rebellious, undermining whispering. It's that grumbling and complaining. That is the heart of a victim who does not want to overcome, but they just want to suck all the attention and the, and the, and the worship away from God, away from you, away from the overcomers. It's the, it's the Esau's and the Cain's of this world. And if you do not repent in that place, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so we're warning this place, okay? I have signs that I've put up around the church. If anyone's wondering who put them up, I put them up. Because while I was praying the other day, the Lord put this in my heart. We need to watch our mouths. We need to watch our mouths. So do you know the Lord constantly had them erect a, a, a pillar or a monument or something as a statement of faith, and it was a sign and a witness to them. Uh, they were to bind it on their foreheads or on their doors or whatever and talk about it constantly. So this is now permission for everyone. It talks about Ephesians 4. Let no unwholesome word 
Useless word come from your mouth, but what? Only what's for grace and edification, the building up of the body, right? Philippians 4, 8 talks about dwelling on lovely, pure things, all of that. That is the only thing that is worth coming out of your mouth in this place, okay? We're here. We assemble together corporately to worship God, to give him praise, to talk about the good things, to sing all his praises. And when we're together, that's all we should talk about. But do you know what? We've gone through some hard things, but instead of looking up, we've started looking down. So this is the challenge. We all need to watch our mouths. Why? Because when the murmuring, when the complaining comes, it disqualifies people. It robs faith from people. So I want you to know, you need to fight. You need to be an overcomer. You need to say, as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Uh, if you want to go down, I'm not coming with you. If you want to be like that generation that died in the wilderness because of their unbelief, I'm not joining in your sin of unbelief. I'm going to be like Joshua and Caleb. I'm going to be like Jacob. I'm going to be like that woman with the issue that pressed in and overcame. And I'm not going to let you disqualify me. That is an atmosphere of faith. And when we all operate in that corporately together, when we watch for predators and say, no, that's not allowed here. You're not following the scriptures. I love you. I care for you. I'm praying for you. But you need to turn that nothing worse happens to you. We all have permission to guard this place together because that's going to build up faith. And then we can enter into the promises of God. All right. So I saw Abraham... That was the word God gave me. He said, I saw Abraham when he has that sacrifice. God's just offered him the covenants, right? And, and that ancestry and that, that promised seed of the Messiah. And he gives the offering in that place. But what happens? Crows come, birds, I don't know, birds of prey. They come and they try to steal it. They try to rob it, and that's what the Lord showed me. There are crows operating in this place. They're synonymous with the demonic. It's not about people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. These are spiritual principles and powers that are not of God. They're opposed to God, and they are trying to rob from this place. They're trying to steal from this place. They're trying to rob and steal from the callings and the destinies of God. Do you know we're all going somewhere together? But a bad apple ruins the bunch. So I felt the Lord say, we need to fight for the faith. We need to fight for this. Abraham drove those birds of prey away. And then I heard Revelation 2.20. It says, I have this against you. You tolerate Jezebel. Say tolerate. tolerate. Tolerate implies you don't like it, but you put up with it. And we've all felt that thing. We feel as Christians, we have to be nice. And we have to put up with stuff. Not when it comes to Jezebel. Throw her down, let dogs eat her face. You know how Bill Johnson and them, they put up quotes on Facebook? <laughs> I'd really love to see that one up there with my name under it. Anyway, listen, you have permission not to tolerate this. If you're in a conversation that makes you feel uncomfortable, stop it. Bring it to the scriptures. You have permission to fight off the crows in your life because if something's coming and pecking at you, it's probably coming and pecking at your neighbor too. So we're going to guard each other in this place because we, Israel didn't get to go into the promised land individually. They had to go corporately. So we need to start caring for the church corporately. You don't get your own life. You don't get your own reward. The bridal company is a corporate group. We're a group. We go in together. So you can't just have your own life and your own interests and your own things and say, well, it doesn't really involve me, so I'm staying out of it. No. If you see somebody trying to disqualify somebody else in this place from, from their eternal reward, stop it. Say, hey, no, that's not a speech that's fitting for a believer. That's not encouraging. Don't bring that in this place. You all have that permission. I tell you all the time, if you see my kids doing something bold, tell them. And I know that's against the culture here, but we need to learn that. The Irish need a backbone again. Why'd we all take, why'd we all lay down and take these lockdowns? And they're taking away more liberties at the moment. Why? Because we haven't fought for the things that God has given us. I'm talking about eternal things. I'm not talking about natural things. So I don't know where my scripture went. Anyway. Um, 
I felt the Lord say, for him, let him who is unrighteous, let him be unrighteous still. But he who is holy or righteous, let him be righteous still. Why? Because the Lord is coming to reward those with what you've done in this earth, what you've sown in this time, the Lord will reward you with. So, so Lord, we just say like, you know, in the, like the Westerns, they post a, po a, a poster of a bad guy and they say, now you're warned, there's a bounty on your head. Lord, we just place a bounty on the head of all murmuring and gossip and slander, all whispering, all, all murmuring and, and uh, accusing in this place. Any spirit that's opposed to God, you're now warned. We put posters up with your bounty on them. Lord, we choose to guard the corporate inheritance in this place. We, guard, we choose to guard the things of God because, Lord, we want to be your bride. And, Lord, we can't do that individually. So, Lord God, we just give you the things of our heart. Lord, any place where selfish ambition is, any place where a victim spirit is, any place where bitterness or unforgiveness is causing us to operate in an ungodly way, Lord, now is your time. Repent of that. Repent of that. Don't leave this place until you repent of that. Get it out. No matter how ugly, I don't care what you have to do, snot bubbles and all on the floor, do it before God today. Because if you don't, God's against you in this place. He will weed you out. You've been warned by the Lord. This is not my word. This is what the Lord gave me to bring today. He said, this ends now. This ends now. So Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Lord God, you have a reward for those who overcome, but we have to choose. We have to choose to put that on daily. We have to choose to put that on daily. So we just say, faith arise in this place. Faith arise. Just shake off all those things. Shake off all those words and those burrs and those relationships that are sticking to you. Say, no matter what comes around me, I choose to follow Jesus. I choose to overcome, and I choose to walk in his ways. Amen. So I don't have time to go into all of this, but I have a helpful guide, and I'm going to leave it on the screen. And if you need to come forward and pray, you pray. And I want you to read through this list because this is the discourse for this place. Before you ask someone a question or say something to somebody or before you listen to a question or somebody saying something, you need to ask yourself these questions first. It's, we have to examine everything. The, the Bible says hold every thought captive. It says the one who guards his mouth protects his life. So let's examine this, bring these things before the Lord and let's walk together together in overcoming faith into the things that the Lord has for us. Amen? Amen.